Life is good, I thought when Chantel both fell asleep. Sometimes you really find the light when you go into a dark tunnel. Let me introduce myself. I'm Mickey Olrud, a 60-year-old divorced regular guy, father of two grown children, grandfather of two who are slightly younger than my partner that night. About that partner. Chantel, the youngest of my women. I'm not bragging. Well, I guess I am. But I have four women that I sleep with regularly. There's nothing serious with any of them, although I know at least two would like something serious. But it's just good no, great sex, no strings attached, almost every time I call and want a date, or they call me for the same purpose. I know it sounds ridiculously simple and casual, but that's how it is. And I owe it all to my cheating ex-wife, Tracy, for opening the door to this wonderful life. Fifteen years ago, I was a happily married man with one child graduating from college and one child in college. My beautiful wife, Tracy, and I were still getting used to this life without children, and at 45 we were enjoying life. Without kids around, we were free to fool around whenever we wanted, just like before kids started, and we never had to worry about Tracy being too loud. Without children around, she began to really let go, and with encouragement, I tried even more to please the woman I loved. For the last 18 months or so, we've had to keep the windows closed and the air conditioner on in the house during the warmer months because we didn't want the neighbors to think I was killing her. Tracy and I met in college our sophomore year. We started dating in our third year and got married a few months after graduation. I honestly don't know how I managed to get her. She was stunning long blonde hair, blue eyes, about 5'5", five, five, 120 pounds with big firm breasts and a cute round ass. She was clearly above my level, but despite all her admirers in college, she chose me, a skinny six-foot guy with a head of unruly hair who was studying to become an electrical engineer. I got a job at a large engineering firm on the East Coast shortly after we got married, and Tracy, who had a degree in finance, went into management at an investment firm. We made good money and lived quite well. Lauren was born two years later, and then Molly was born another two years later. Since I made good money, we could afford Tracy to be a housewife, which she did until the children went to school. Then she returned to her old company, and with two incomes we decided to move to a fairly large house in a fairly expensive area. Life is what it is, and you deal with it and move on. As the kids got older, life became more stressful with their sports, clubs, and everything else. I had my own things to do, like my golf group, and Tracy had her own things to do, like her theater group. I never kept an eye on her affairs too closely because I trusted her completely, just as I assumed she trusted me completely because she never asked too many questions when I told her I was going to the bar for a couple after work drinks, or playing golf with my golf group. How I found out Tracy was cheating on me was a cliché I caught her off guard by returning home a day early from a business trip. I don't go on business trips often, maybe three times a year, but for this trip I had to be on the West Coast for the entire week. But things were completed a day faster than we expected, and my boss and I flew out of Los Angeles a day early, arriving in the city around 7 p.m. I decided to surprise Tracy, so I didn't tell her I was coming early. As far as I knew, Tracy didn't have any plans for the weekend, so I thought I'd catch her watching her favorite shows like NCIS or something. She didn't tell me that she had any plans when I left. Before we headed home, my boss Bob and I decided to stop at a place he knew near the airport for a couple of drinks. Our trip was a great success and was going to pay big dividends in the future, so he provided the treats. I didn't mind a couple of drinks, we took a table in the center of the bar and both ordered monkey shoulder on the rocks. I'd never been to this place before, but Bob had, and he said it was a quiet business, catering to those who wanted to succeed, but were careful not to be too pretentious. Monkey shoulder's pitch told me that they understand what good but not too noticeable tape is. Five minutes later, I saw Bob's eyes become the size of saucers as he looked at someone or something behind me. Not really wanting to turn around completely, I asked Bob to tell me what he was looking at. He quickly wiped the drool from the corner of his mouth and said, Damn it, Mick. This young guy just walked in with this hottie who's probably old enough to be his mother. 
I'm sure this guy is sleeping with her. God. With a description like that, I just had to turn and look. Bob wasn't exaggerating. She was built like a goddess. I hope she's not sleeping with that guy, I told Bob dryly, because that's my wife, Tracy. I slowly turned back in my chair as Bob literally spat out his drink. Nice move, Bob. Is she looking our way now? I asked. No, he replied, wiping his mouth with a napkin. You're not kidding, right? No. Damn, Mick. What are you going to do? I think you could go up there and break that guy's neck. I think in our state you can do that and get away with it and call it a lot of stress. I lift weights regularly, and at least on the surface, it looked like I could probably break the guy's neck. But being an engineer, I tend to analyze things carefully rather than react emotionally, and while a small part of me wanted to kill this guy before, a larger part of me wanted to shake my wife and find out what was going on and why. So I made Bob sit with me and drink, while the two of them had a nice dinner. Bob could see everything that happened at their table and reported everything to me, from holding hands to an intimate kiss. When they finally got up to leave, Bob paid our bill, and I told him I'd be gone tomorrow before following the couple at a safe distance. Got it, he mumbled. They must have arrived at the bar together because Tracy got into his car, and they drove off, and I followed them in my car. They drove to a house that I guessed was his house in a pretty nice area. I remembered the address as I drove by and went to our house. It was 8.30 p.m. Tracy did not return home that night. Since she didn't expect me until around dinner time tomorrow, she didn't have to worry about getting home. I obviously couldn't sleep much that night. I tried to sleep in our bed, but the more I thought about what I saw, the angrier I became so I went down to the living room and slept restlessly on the couch. Before morning, I drove my car out of the garage again and parked a little further down the street, knowing that Tracy wouldn't see her because she wouldn't look. The entrance to the house from the garage leads into the kitchen, so around 7 a.m. I made myself a big pot of coffee and some toast and sat at the kitchen table, facing the door, with the lights off. I had already drunk three cups of coffee when around nine I heard the outside door open and Tracy came in a few seconds later. The look on her stunned face was priceless as I snapped a photo of her on my iPhone. In fact, she was so startled to see anyone in the kitchen, let alone me, that she screamed and ran back to the door she had just closed behind her. When she realized it was me in the kitchen, she screamed again, but this time the words were, Damn it. What the hell are you doing at home? She half asked, half got angry at me. Then she must have realized what she looked like. Her lipstick was almost wiped off, her makeup was smeared on her cheeks, and her hair was completely disheveled. And then this dress, like that of a woman of easy virtue, which I have never seen before. It's not what you think, Mickey, started screaming at me, but I quickly raised both hands, as if a gun was pointed at me, and she fell silent. Sorry, Tracy, but that's exactly what I think. Young Jack Axelrod, and you must have had a great night. I'm sure he's late for work at the university this morning, too. She faltered, staggered, faltered again, and finally ran upstairs to the bathroom. I heard the sound of the shower running shortly after, and while it was running, I quietly opened the bathroom door, found her underwear on the floor, put them in a plastic bag for evidence if necessary, and left the room without letting her know that I was there. At 51, Stephanie was just beginning to open up, it seemed to me. Sure, she no longer had the body of a 25-year-old, but considering she had two kids, the time she'd spent in the gym over the past few years had definitely paid off. She had medium-length brown hair that framed an angular face with sparkling blue eyes. And although her body was no longer that of a 25-year-old, she was a confident, mature woman, ready to be someone's partner for life, if someone was smart enough to realize it. I certainly saw it, but no, I wasn't ready to go down the path of life with someone, so for now, Stephanie and I were very good friends with great benefits. Stephanie and I have been dating, um, for six years. Stephanie was married for 15 years to her high school sweetheart, until he decided he wanted a younger model when Stephanie turned 35. We've been dating since she was 45. Life is good, 
I thought as we both drifted off to sleep. Tracy claimed she didn't have sex with Jack Axelrodum that night. She explained that her makeup was smeared because they were dancing and she was sweating. She explained that she didn't come home that night because it was late, and since she wasn't expecting me at home, there was no point in driving home that late, so she slept on the couch axelrod. Yes, sure. When I didn't say anything, she took it as a sign of weakness and went on the offensive. How do you know his name? You were spying on me, right? She squealed. Actually, no, but it's not a bad idea, I replied. I saw you two last night at the bar and then followed you to his house. I extended my hand. Phone, now. Tracy reluctantly handed me the phone from her purse. I knew she didn't have a password because she's bad at remembering passwords, and she knew I would never betray her trust by looking at her phone without permission. But that was until yesterday. Over the past month, there have been three calls and four messages from Jack Axelrod. All signs pointed to this affair going on for at least that long. Well, at least he's not married, so only one of you needs a divorce, I said sarcastically. Oh no, Mick, we don't need a divorce. I told you we didn't have sex. We were just dancing, and these messages aren't about what you think, she said, surprisingly cheerfully. So you're saying that when I check your underwear, I won't find anything? I asked sharply. Tracy blushed. Such was the 24-year marriage life. Oh my God, Tracy, he's 28 years old. That's only five years older than our oldest child. You don't love me anymore? How could you do this to me? But I love you, Mick, she replied with tears in her eyes. I don't love Jack. It was just sex with a younger guy. It doesn't mean anything. I always plan to come home to you every night. So because of sex, you just decided that you don't need me anymore. But you're still my husband, still the man I love, and if you have a little patience with me, I'm sure we can work this out. You must be crazy if you think I'm going to continue this, I said as I grabbed my car keys and walked out the door. The object of my affections was Livy, a 60-year-old woman, the eldest of my partners, but she could still rock. She came into my life about four years ago, she is about 5'7", weighs 150 pounds, and has a body that could be mistaken for that of a 45-year-old. She has small breasts, but just the right size butt. Her first husband, who was 10 years older than her, died about a dozen years ago, probably with a huge smile on his face. She didn't choose her second husband so well, and divorced him after three years because he just couldn't keep up with her. We went to bed. Life is good. I thought before falling asleep. A month later, I filed for divorce from Tracy on the grounds of her infidelity. It's just sex, Mickey. There's nothing more to it. Let me have a little fun for a while, what do you guys call it a temporary pass, and then I'll be yours forever. And I'll be so grateful that you gave this as a gift to me that I will return it to you forever, she said, emphasizing the last word. Tracy, this will never happen. I said as sincerely and calmly as possible. I will not share you with another man. When I said I agree, I meant it for life. If you told me now that you would stop this stupidity, I would welcome you with open arms, even though you plunged a knife deep into my soul. Tracy lowered her eyes and began to cry. Her silence told me everything I needed. Okay, divorce. Lauren and Molly weren't very happy when I told them about the divorce, and even less when I told them why. I didn't see the point in covering anything up or hiding it behind Tracy. She was the one who cheated, let her deal with the consequences herself. Lauren asked me if I had any evidence or if this was just my guess. I told her about seeing her mother with another man at a bar, then following them to his house and watching her stay there overnight. I also said that I have physical proof of the affair if she wants to see it. Molly asked why I didn't approach them at the bar, and I said I didn't because they would have just lied and not given me evidence that I was sure was more than a one-time incident. Besides, I added, murder is still illegal in this state. They both apologized to me for doubting them. Tracy did not contest the divorce, and we split our assets in half. The divorce was finalized four months later. Like most evenings with Erica, 
This one started with dim lights and light conversation before we moved on to sex. Of my current four girls, Erica has been with me the longest just over nine years. She is a 38-year-old mother of two twin girls who divorced 12 years ago. It seems her husband also had an affair with a neighbor a few doors down, and it was a messy divorce that left deep scars. Erica is a long-haired brunette with big brown eyes. Her waist looks tiny in comparison, and she attracts a lot of looks from men, and I think some women. She could meet much more often than now, but you know, there are scars from the past. Life is good, I thought as we drifted off to sleep. I didn't think seriously about another woman for two years after the divorce. No, what ifs, when I saw a beautiful woman. Nothing. It was like this part of me was dead. I did my job and came home to an empty apartment after we sold the house. At least I learned how to cook so I didn't have to grab fast food or pop tarts every night. I even thought about getting a dog for company, but that would require a commitment I wasn't yet ready for. Then one Saturday, after Bob and I had finished a round of golf, we were sitting at the bar when an unaccompanied goddess in her twenties walked past us. God, I wish I could sleep with her, I almost whispered to Bob. Bob looked up from the results card and said, Why not? You're free. You can sleep with anyone, if that's what they want to. And then it dawned on me. I was free, and I could sleep with anyone, as long as they wanted me. You're a fucking genius, Bob, I told him, getting up from the table and heading towards the goddess in the club's dining room. The goddess, who turned out to be named Avery Billings, said yes to my request for her phone number, and then three days later said yes to my request for a date. I don't know why she said yes. I mean, I was a 47-year-old guy who went to the gym regularly, but she was an absolute goddess. Long, silky blonde hair, big blue eyes, and a well-proportioned and toned body. She looked like Christy Brinkley in her heyday. These are not the women who should date Mickey Olrud, but she said yes. Bob was probably more shocked than I was when I told him she said yes. We've discussed my lack of interest in women several times over the past two years, and he seemed really concerned about me, like an old friend. Hell, his wife, Sierra, even offered to set me up with one of her single friends so I could get my life started, so to speak. I took Avery to the best Italian restaurant in town, partly because there were plenty of booths, private, and partly because of the food. It seems that the goddess was a 28-year-old scientist in one of the government agencies in our city. She was smart, funny, and exciting. Her mind was as beautiful as her appearance. I sat mesmerized by her stories about plant pollination, not understanding much, but completely engrossed in the sound of her voice. She seemed a little attracted to me, too. I tried to keep our conversation cheerful and intelligent and resisted the urge to drool over her. She noticed that I didn't wear rings like her and asked if I still lived with my mother or was divorced. I told her the truth but kept the information minimal because I didn't want Tracy to interfere with my evening. We walked around the entertainment district of our city after dinner. After five minutes of walking, she took my hand and I easily placed her small hand in mine. When I brought her home, she invited me for coffee and I agreed. We sat in her kitchen chatting for about an hour before I decided I didn't want to overstay my welcome, so I stood up and said goodbye. She walked me to the door, and when I told her I had a wonderful evening, she stood on her tiptoes, walked over, and kissed me. That must mean I get a second date, mister, she said softly but clearly. I think I floated to the car, and I think my car floated on the way home that night. I don't remember how I got home. We didn't make love until our third date, and we did it at her apartment after an evening of eating, drinking, and dancing. I'm no wizard on the dance floor, but Avery wanted me to go. I think it was a kind of test. Hell, I'd walk through fire for this woman, so dancing wasn't a problem. We were on the dance floor almost the entire time we were in the club fast songs, slow songs, it doesn't matter. A couple of times a guy tried to intervene, but I stopped him the first time and Avery managed it the second time. At least for me, it felt like we were alone and no one else mattered. I think we both knew what would happen when we got back to her apartment. I have to admit, I was pretty excited. 
I haven't been with a woman since I divorced Tracy, and at 47, I'm no longer a boy. Damn it, Mickey, she said. I've never done this with anyone before. Well, apparently I'm not just anyone, I said smugly. After a few quiet minutes, Avery asked softly, So if you're so talented, how could your ex-wife leave you? Are you a serial killer or something? We hadn't discussed my marriage too much before, and although she did it as a joke, I felt like Avery wanted to know more about it. So I told her. I don't seem to be gifted below the belt, but her boyfriend was, I said bluntly. You never told me your ex-wife was an idiot, she replied. By the way, did I hear you correctly? Is your wife no longer with him? According to my children, they broke up after a year. I have to believe them. I don't communicate with her and don't follow her activities. That love started to fade the day I caught her cheating, and by now it may have only remained on a memory level. It was great while it lasted. Well, most of the time it lasted, but now all she means to me is the woman with whom I had two amazing daughters. See, that proves my point, she asked. Wait a minute, I said in shock. Do you think I should have waited for her to come back to me after her fun? You didn't listen to what I just said, dumbass. Her abandoning him after a short time is because there's more to a relationship than just good sex. That's what I said. But no, no one should wait for a woman to come into himself before he moves on. Some men can and do, some men cannot and will not. Although I have my own personal views on what is right and wrong, in general, it is a decision. Remains with the injured party. And from your personal point of view, I asked, while I'm sorry for your pain, her loss is my gain. I think she's an idiot. Did I mention Avery was a goddess? I moved in with Avery three months after we started dating, and six months later, I bought an engagement ring. My daughters had met her several times by this point and both fell in love with her. It seems that the karmic balance of the universe has returned to me again. I was going to give her a ring at an intimate dinner I had planned for Saturday night. And then karma changed again. On Thursday afternoon, Avery called me at work to say that she would be a little late, but she had a big announcement and she was paying for dinner. We agreed to meet for dinner at 7 p.m. at a fancy restaurant, and when I got there, she was already sitting at a table with a guy about my age at another table across from her. They laughed and drank champagne. My first reaction when I saw them was anger, and I thought about turning around and leaving, but then I decided to walk up to the table, and, if it was what I thought it was, this time I was going to beat the guy up. I told the woman at the counter which table I was going to, and she showed me to Avery's table. As soon as I approached, Avery saw me, jumped up, and practically ran into my arms. She kissed me deeply on the lips before introducing me. Mickey, this is Dr. Ko Ken Otain, director of Zai's Enterprises, one of the leading scientific communities on the West Coast. He has just offered me a position on their team in San Diego. I will be working on plant-based research for cancer treatments. Dr. Otain stood up, and we shook hands. I tried to look as happy as Avery, but deep down I knew this was the beginning of the end for us. This was Avery's dream, the major league of her profession. There was no way she would give this up to stay here with me, and if I wasn't ready and willing to pack up my life and go with her right now, it was right to let her go. The champagne flowed freely, and the evening was magnificent. Avery and Autain told me about every detail of her job, the high salary, and incredible benefits. The salary was even more than the $250,000 that I earned. Everything sounded great, but after an hour I was tired of waiting for another catch. When do you start? I finally asked. Avery turned pale when she heard the question, the first time I had seen such a reaction from her in our entire relationship. She had already made her decision without discussing it with me first. This told me everything I needed to know. She may have loved me even a lot, but not enough for me to influence her most important decisions. Obviously my love for her ran deeper because in my pocket, there was a ring that meant she would make decisions with me for the rest of our lives. But this ring will remain where it is. November 2nd. In a month, Avery answered, lifeless. I didn't say anything, just sat and looked at her until Otain, not understanding the situation, 
proposed a toast to the next Zai's superstar. The three of us touched glasses, and Avery returned to the festive mood Autain had been in. The party was over for me, and I don't think I said another fifty words the entire evening. Avery was still on her high when we got home, and between her news and the champagne, she was ready for action. I, on the other hand, was completely unprepared for action, and frankly, I needed to talk. So this is how it ends, she finally said. Can't we at least discuss this first? That's exactly what we should do and could do, I replied. But you made the decision first. Now we will discuss this in the second stage, and there is no point in that. You could come with me to San Diego. A guy with your skills and intelligence could easily find a job and make big money in a short time. Big Western money, to be exact. Believe me, I thought about it all evening while you two were laughing. But it always came down to the fact that you made the decision for yourself, not us together. I'm number two in a respectable company, and someday I'll be number one. I've been working for this company for over 25 years, and this may be my dream job. But you never took that into account. I overestimated your feelings for me. I tapped the ring in my right trouser pocket. I didn't get it. Avery didn't know that I had been carrying her engagement ring with me for a week. The gesture was not for her. He was there for me. The apartment was quiet for several days, and we did not communicate. Finally, on the third night, after dinner, Avery came up to me and whispered, I'm sorry, I've been incredibly selfish. Can't we talk about this like adults? No, I answered simply. You have to do this become a superstar's eyes, Autain. Light up the world. Don't leave anyone behind. I know it. You know it. We made love for the next few weeks until it really was the last time. Avery traveled to the West Coast several times, chose an apartment, and shipped her belongings and car there before leaving. Although my heart was breaking, I wanted her to know that she was loved. When her alarm rang in the morning, we both got up very carefully, but we both smiled. She had one more gift for me before she left. Mick, can you do me one more favor? She asked tenderly. A colleague. More precisely, a former colleague. She's not very lucky ever since she divorced her scoundrel husband several years ago. You can call her, invite her to dinner, and if everything works out, show her that you are a more desirable woman. I promise, I said, raising my right hand as if swearing an oath to office. She handed me a piece of paper and then I kissed Avery one last time. We both had tears in our eyes when we broke the hug. She carried her small bag to the waiting taxi. Avery's last gift turned out to be Katie. Alspa, a 43-year-old red-haired woman with a toned body and thin stork legs, 5'10 in height. She had a 16-year-old son with whom she shared custody with her ex-husband, an ex-medium weight who sometimes beat her while she put him in jail for it. She was married for 12 years and divorced for the last 10. Avery's last gift also happened to be the first of my girlfriends. Katie and I dated for six years, during which time my current lifestyle took shape. Since neither Katie nor I wanted to commit, we both agreed that we would date others. The system worked, although I must admit that for a while I became stupid and had too many women. Now, at 49 years old, this proved to be too much for me physically, and I quickly realized that four was a good number. I could meet all four over a two-week period so no one would feel forgotten. I also found, which is much easier to follow desires and preferences with only four women. Every now and then I lose a girlfriend to some other guy when they decide to be exclusive, and I'm glad about it because honestly I want all of my partners to be happy. I can't blame a woman for leaving me for someone else. We always go our separate ways as friends, and I will always treasure the memories each of them has given me. Who knows? Maybe someday I'll decide to be exclusive myself, and then... There is an old saying about revenge that goes something like, The best revenge is a life well lived. I never thought about it until a couple of years ago when I received a call from my youngest daughter, Molly. I maintain regular contact with my daughters and their growing families. I am very proud to be a grandfather, and they know about my relationship. 
In fact, over the years, they both became attached to several of my girls and sometimes rooted for one of them. Hey, Dad, Mom wants you to call her, Molly said after the greetings. Says she's ready to settle down and grow old with you. WHW, what the hell, I muttered. I was completely at a loss. Except for a few grumbling at family gatherings that I didn't want to miss, I hadn't spoken to my ex-wife in 13 years. Although it is difficult to simply stop loving someone coldly after over 20 years of marriage, I did my best to do just that. There were no casual conversations, no notes, nothing. I simply acted as if she no longer existed. What, crap gosh, is she talking about growing old together? Why does she torment me after 13 years? After her romance with Jack Axelrodham, Tracy dated various men until she found husband Hash 2, a real estate agent named Steve Gillespie, about three years later. He was a few years older than her, 52, and both my daughters said he seemed like a nice guy. I've never met him. I wasn't invited to the wedding, which is good because I wouldn't have gone. When he arrived, I stopped attending family gatherings that Tracy was present at. Let them enjoy time with their grandchildren without my presence. I would arrive a week later, sometimes with one of my girls. They especially loved Stephanie. The only good thing I can say about Steve Gillespie is that he's not Jack Axelrod, and I didn't want to hit him. Oh yeah, when Tracy married him, I stopped paying child support. The marriage lasted seven years before they divorced. The girls mentioned it to me, but they knew not to discuss it with me. Are you still on the line, Dad? Molly asked, bringing me out of my thoughts. Yeah, baby, still here. Sorry, lost in thought. I'm sure it is, Dad. Are you going to call her? What should I tell her? Tell her that I don't have her number and don't give it to me. If she wants to talk to me, she can call me. I have the same number I've had since we were married. Fine. We talked about a few other things before she hung up. Apparently she passed on the message, because two days later Tracy called me. What the hell do you want? I growled, answering the call, assuming that the unknown number was her. Okay, Mickey, you won. You survived me. You punished me. Now can we stop all this nonsense and grow old together like we planned about a hundred years ago? Don't tell me you still don't love me. I know that you date many, but I know that you could never replace me in your heart, just like I could never replace you. Let's admit that we belong to each other. Tracy, this is the second time you've misunderstood me, I said. The first was when you thought that I couldn't live without you and would let you have a lover, Jack Axelrod. Now you think I never remarried because I still love you. I've had a wonderful life since we broke up, Tracy. I especially wouldn't trade the last 11 years for anything. We had a wonderful period until you ended it, and after some difficult years I had a wonderful period again. Maybe someday I'll want to settle down and grow old with someone, but you ruined that chance when you slept with someone else, a man. I didn't say goodbye. I just quietly hung up. Round rings... You know, as they say, the circle of life. I put my hand in the right front pocket of my pants and touched the small box containing the wedding ring. I held Stephanie's small hand in my left hand. I placed my right hand on the small of her back as we moved across the dance floor at Avery's wedding. I received an invitation by mail two months ago. I haven't interacted with Avery that much in recent years, the occasional text or email, but I was thrilled to receive the invitation. She played an important role in my life at a critical time, and if circumstances had been different, she would have become Mrs. Mickey Olrood. Instead, at the age of 42, she was going to become Mrs. Joachim Nagel, married for the first time for both. She achieved success, becoming one of the world's leading plant pathologists, and met the respected doctor, Nagel, through her research into cancer treatment. The two respected doctors got together, and the rest, as they say, is history. I almost couldn't be more pleased. My invitation included a plus one, and after weeks of deliberation, I decided to invite Stephanie on this trip. And then I got to thinking. And it just clicked for me. It was Avery's help once again. She was the one who helped start my current lifestyle, and she was the one who will probably end it. I never told anyone about buying an engagement ring for Avery all those years ago, not even her. 
I didn't want this to become a problem. I knew I had to let her go, so I quietly returned the ring to my favorite jeweler, but never received a refund. I don't know why, but I told him to just leave my money and one day I'll come back and buy something else. Two weeks ago, I bought that same thing and have been carrying it with me ever since. Stephanie and I both took two weeks off and drove to California for the wedding, making some stops along the way to visit museums and zoos. I have often told people that one way to test your compatibility with another person is to go on a long road trip together, and this trip showed me that I was making the right decision. We arrived in San Diego a couple of days before the wedding and were able to hang out with happy newlyweds. I received a big hug from the bride to be upon first meeting and was introduced throughout as her most special friend in the whole world. I'm sure she told Joachim about our past, but since I came with a friend, he didn't feel threatened and was actually a very nice guy, probably the kind of guy I would have chosen for Avery if I couldn't be with her. I told Stephanie about Avery years ago, without mentioning just the ring, so Stephanie knew that Avery and I had something special. If it bothered her the least bit, she didn't show it, and in fact, they both got along just fine. Life is good, I thought as my wife Stephanie, and I slowly drifted off to sleep. Sometimes you really find the light when you go into a dark tunnel.